Is anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Would you give Jesus some praise for a second? For those of you that may not know who I am, my name is Pastor Charlie Hughes. I have the privilege of leading the young adult movement here at church by the glaze called Rally. I see some Rally young adults in the building. Can you make some noise, Rally young adults? My 18 to 30-year-olds, okay. Are there any uh, young adults at heart in the room this morning? Just, okay. I'm going to let you guys pretend for the next 35 minutes or so that you're at Rally. So make the most of it. Have some fun. I don't want to preach this sermon by myself this morning. Is there anybody in the room who's going to preach with me today? Would you let me know? So, so excited. Listen, real quick. Next week is a weekend you cannot and do not want to miss because it is week one of our brand new series entitled Trending. And if you've been here at Church by the Glades for quite some time, then you know that week one of our fall launch series is a weekend you don't want to miss. God always meets us here in amazing ways, and you want to be a part of that. So make sure you come, bring somebody with you. My dad, Pastor David, will be back in the building next weekend preaching. So if you know him and love him, he'll be bringing the word. But today, you're stuck with me. Look to the person sitting next to you and tell him, we're stuck with this guy this morning. We're stuck with him. Dang it. We're stuck with him. I'm glad that you're stuck with me. I've come prayed up, prepared. I believe I'm locked and loaded, ready to go. I've come to preach like it's the last time I'm ever going to preach in my life. Can I preach it how I feel it this morning? Yeah. Well, I'm ready. I'm ready. I want to start this morning a little differently than usual. Look to the person on your left. Now look to the person on your right. Decide right now which one you like more. I want you to look to that person, and I want you to tell them what children's TV channel was on most when you were a kid growing up. Or if you're the parent, a grandparent, an uncle, an aunt, um, you can just say what TV children's channel maybe is on in your house most right now. Go ahead. Go ahead and do it. Okay. Where are all of my Nickelodeon families at? Make some noise. Wave at me. Okay. Where are all of my Disney Channel families at? These are all the homeschool families, in case you were wondering. Where are the Cartoon Network families at? Let's just extend our hands towards these people. They need prayer and deliverance. They're dealing with some type of trauma in their household. We're, we're praying for you. We're with you. As you can probably tell, I'm a uh, Nickelodeon guy. I grew up on Nickelodeon primarily. And growing up, one of my favorite shows on Nickelodeon was a show called Drake and Josh. Anybody remember it? It's an awesome show. And one of my favorite characters on this show was actually the manager of the movie theater that Josh worked at. Her name was Helen. Helen was large and in charge. She was funny. She was sassy. And it was actually revealed in one episode of Drake and Josh that Helen, this fictional character, was actually a child TV star herself. And in this show that Helen was in as a child, she had a catchphrase. And her catchphrase was, that is not my job. <laughs> that is not my job. Look to your second choice now, the other person, the one that you don't like as much as the first person you look to, and tell them, that is not my job like you mean it with some sass. Tell them, that is not my job. <laughs> the title of this sermon is, that is not my job. <laughs> Open up your Bibles, turn on your Bibles. We are going to be in the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be in chapter 6. We are going to read a portion, a segment of the greatest sermon ever preached by Jesus Christ himself. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to read verses 25 through 33 of chapter 6. It reads this. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, or reap, or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? 
Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or splend. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, the richest man in history, in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Here are the two verses I really want you to lean into and pay attention to. Verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I believe the reason why so many people have no joy today is because they are too worried about tomorrow. When you attach your joy to something in the future, joy becomes something that is impossible for you to obtain and experience today. And you will turn today into nothing more than a temporary waiting period in your mind where worry is welcome and all contentment for the current moment is cast away. And I think too often people allow their fear for the future and their frustration with how far they think they are from what it is that they want cause them to sign up for a job that does not belong to them and assume a responsibility that was never meant for them by trying to write their own story, take control of their own destiny, and snatch the pen out of the hand of the one who already knows the end from the beginning. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not telling you to not plan, prepare, or pray about your future. But... If your joy has become completely, totally, entirely predicated and wrapped around your future being exactly what you want it to be, I'm sorry to break it to you, but true joy will be something that always eludes you and you will find yourself time and time and time again settling and chasing after less than God's best for your life. Whatever little royalties of pleasure you may already be getting, from the future you're trying to write looking bright, isn't even real joy anyways. Whatever hope you have that's making you think you know what you're doing by taking responsibility of your tomorrow in a way that you should not is a counterfeit version of the authentic, eternal, inexpressible joy that God desires for you to experience within the context of his will for your life. That's what you call happiness, not joy. There's a difference. Can I break it down for you this morning? Can I break it down for you this morning? Romans chapter 12 verse 12 says that we are to be joyful in hope. Joy and hope are innately interconnected. It's really hard to have one without the other. Like if you were to tell me, yo, Charlie, I got a lot of hope right now, but not a lot of joy. I'd be like, I don't think you have that much hope. Or if you were to tell me, yo, I got a lot of joy, but I have no hope, I would say, I think you're lying. You can't have joy without hope, and I don't think you can have hope without joy. The two go hand in hand. But if we really want to get to the bottom as to what Romans 12, 12 is saying, when it tells us to be joyful in hope, I think we must ask ourselves the question, in what do most people find hope in. I think most people find hope in the potential of something they've been wanting and waiting for and working towards beginning to be realized. Maybe you're here today and you'd say that you've got hope right now because you're in the running for a promotion. Maybe you're here 
And you'd say, yeah, I've got hope because you believe that a raise might be coming your way. I mean, that'd give me hope. Anybody else? Maybe you're here and you recently signed up for a life group. I'd encourage you to do so. And you're hopeful that you're going to meet people in this group who could become good friends of yours. Or maybe you've recently been on a few dates with somebody and things have been going well. You seem to like each other and you're hopeful that this person you've been on a few dates with will become someone in the near future that you are officially dating. Or maybe perhaps you've been dating somebody for a while and you're hopeful that the future is looking bright or should I say shiny? Are there any ladies in this place that I'm preaching to right now? <laughs> Don't look at him, look at me. Don't look at him, look at me. Keep your eyes <laughs> forward. There could be a plethora of reasons why you are currently experiencing hope in your life today. But if the reason you currently have hope are any of the reasons that I just gave you, then I think we might have a problem. Because this is not the hope that Romans 12, 12 is describing. I don't think this is being joyful in hope. I think this is being happy in hope. You see, happiness is based on and rooted in happenings. A while back, I went on a few dates with this girl, and things were going good. I liked her. She seemed to like me. And one night, as I drove her home, and she was about to get out of my car to walk back into her house, she looked at me, and she asked me, what's your expectation for our relationship? That question kind of caught me off guard. <laughs> I was like, um, well, like I, I like you. I think you like me. Assuming things keep going well. Um, my hope is that we take that natural next step and make things official. She took a second, paused, thought to herself, then she opened up her mouth and she said, yeah, I don't think I'm in the place to be in a relationship right now. All my hope and happiness in that moment evaporated into thin air. It went out the window. I'm just trying to make the point that hope that is found in happenings, hope that is rooted in potential, is hope that ultimately has an expiration date. It's hope that has a hole in it. I would not call it hope that is shallow, but I would call it hope that is hollow. As I understand it, joy is different from happiness in that it is transcendent of circumstance. As depicted in Scripture, joy is a supernatural feeling of fulfillment and pleasure that comes from God that is consistent, constant, perpetual, eternal. So with these definitions and distinctions in mind, what I'm getting from Romans 12, 12, when it tells us to be joyful and hope, is that our joy will only be as strong, as reliable, as consistent as what we choose to place our hope in. So if you want a hope that makes you happy and lasts a little while, then by all means, Place your hope in potential. Find your hope in happenings. But, oh, if you want a hope that makes you joyful and is incapable of failing you, disappointing you, or running out, then I recommend that you find your hope in something that is just as reliable, that is just as consistent, that is just as never failing, that is just as unchanging. If you want a consistent hope and a persistent joy, that comes with it. You need a consistent source. You need a consistent source. I think so often the reason why we can take a look at our world and it can seem as if joy is in such short supply is because our world has gotten too used to finding hope in the potential of what excites us rather than in the God who cares for us. So when we take inventory of our lives and there seems to be no potential for anything exciting, there's no hope and there's no joy. But you can find great hope and great joy in this. 
Scripture says that our God is Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. He is the first. He is the last. Way before your problem ever stepped on a scene. And long before potential ever had a say. King Jesus has been seated on the throne. He's been with you. He's been for you all along. And he's not planning on going anywhere. This is why Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10 tells us that we don't have to live in a constant state of whining, crying, grieving, lamenting, mourning when what we thought would last and satisfy us ends up failing us. No, but rather, but instead the joy of the Lord can be our strength. Jesus wants the joy that we have in him to be the source of our hope and the sustenance of our strength. Is there anybody who knows that to be true in this place? But this verse, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, the joy of the Lord is our strength. This verse gives me some insights into the strategy of our enemy. Because if the joy we have in Jesus is supposed to be our strength, then this means the devil, your enemy, yes, he's real, and he's going to do everything in his power to try to steal your strength by attacking your joy. By trying to shift your focus from the joy, the love, and the victory you have in Jesus and placing it on situations and circumstances and problems in your life that leave you feeling defeated. Your enemy wants you to believe that waiting on God is not worth it and a waste of your time. Your enemy wants you to believe that all of your problems are too urgent to be on God's timeline. That if you don't find someone to marry now, you're never going to find somebody. So you might as well settle for the first loser who comes your way, who does not treat you like the masterpiece that God says you are, even if they'll end up putting a lid on all that God wants to do in and for and through your life. That if you don't get a job and start making money now, You'll never be able to one day live comfortably and retire. So you might as well take the first job you can find, drop out of school, quit your internship, even if it means that you'll one day be unequipped and unprepared when the time would have eventually come for you to step into the unique calling that God has placed you on this planet for. By allowing our concern with what it is the future holds, to coerce us into trying to take control of our tomorrow. We prove just how unfit we are for the job we're trying to do because we think we're thinking ahead. We think we're being responsible. We think that we're thinking thoroughly, but really, we aren't thinking far ahead enough. As scholar and theologian, C.S. Lewis writes, if you aim at heaven, you'll get earth thrown in. But if you aim at earth, you'll get neither. As human beings who, unlike God, are limited by time, space, and matter, we don't have the capacity today for tomorrow to be our concern. And we don't have the capability to know or control what's going to happen in our tomorrow anyways. So if we want to have any shot at getting back our joy, if we want to have any shot at repossessing our peace, if we want to have any shot, any chance at finding faith for the future, then we must acknowledge and we must accept that tomorrow is not our job and now is necessary. Today is what God wants to use to build trust equity. Our trust in him, but also his trust in us. It's the mystery that surrounds tomorrow from today's vantage point that God wants to use to encourage us to trust in him. It's in light of our own inabilities that God wants us to realize how powerful he is and encourage us to rely on him. Of course, from where you're standing right now, today, when you think about all you're going to have to one day navigate and figure out in your tomorrow, you, it looks intimidating, sounds scary, and you feel like you don't have enough. But you have not yet let today run its course. 
today. It's what's going on in your life today, right here, right now. The good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between that God wants to use to dress you, arm you, equip you, prepare you for every challenge you're going to face in your tomorrow. Today is what God is using to get you ready and build your resume. So here's my advice. Don't give yourself permission to worry about tomorrow until you have persevered through today. I try to practice this advice in my own life. Preaching God's word is one of the greatest joys of my life. There are few things I love as much as preaching. And I don't think there's anything I love as much as preaching to the church by the glades at 1130 service. What's up? <laughs> but there's a lot of work that goes into preparing a sermon. A lot of stress sometimes that goes in to preparing a sermon. I probably spend at least 20 hours on every sermon that I preach. And normally about a week out from every sermon that I preach, I have this moment of panic. Whether it be the writing was harder than expected or the memorization took longer than I thought it would, I'll have this moment where I begin to freak out, worry, and, and think to myself, how in the world am I going to be ready to preach this sermon in time? And this is when I do my best to call an internal timeout, pause, reflect, and remind myself that, Charlie, last time you felt this way and you continued to do what only you can do, and then you trusted that God would honor that by doing what only he can do, when time came for you to step on that stage, you were ready and God showed up. So keep doing what you know to do. Trust God and let the rest of the week play out. Until today is over with, do not worry about tomorrow. Because until today is through, God still has time to show up and prove himself. Maybe you should encourage your today about your tomorrow by reminding yourself of this truth. Stick with me now. Today is the tomorrow you were worried about yesterday. I'm gonna say it again because somebody in this section missed it. Today is the tomorrow you were worried about yesterday. Don't you get spiritual amnesia. Don't you forget how good God has been to you. Don't you go rewriting history and forget the part that God played in your story. Yesterday, you were scared and unsure if you'd even make it today. But with God's help and in God's timing and by God's grace, you made it. You're here. You're standing. You're breathing. So I think you should encourage your today about your tomorrow with the testimony of your yesterday. If God was good and faithful to be there for you last time, then why should you not have the faith to believe that God would be good and faithful to be there for you next time? When you choose to focus on all the times that God did come through for you, on every promise that God keep his word on, Faith for the future no longer seems illogical. Fear for the future is what begins to seem illogical. So I think you should trust God today as if today is already tomorrow's yesterday and he came through. Because the same God who is there for you yesterday is the same God who's there for you today and is the same God who will be there for you tomorrow. Oh, I thought you were going to help me preach this morning in 1130 service. Is there anybody in this place who knows that we serve the same God yesterday, today, and forever? He's not changed. Changing. He's not going anywhere. He's still the same God. Somebody give Jesus some praise in this place for about the next five seconds. He's the same God. But here's the thing. We only have the opportunity to exercise faith in God, trust in God, like this today. Today is the training ground that God wants to use to grow, build, strengthen your trust in him. But today, today is also the trial period 
that God is using to get a good look at your character and observe your behavior to determine if you are deserving of his trust. Someone needs to hear this. The degree to which you trust God will inform God the degree to which he can trust you. Those who trust God with all that they have are those who seek God in all that they do. And because righteousness is the standard that God requires for people to rightly relate with him, to seek God is to seek living righteously. It's accepting. It's choosing to chase after what heaven has to offer and realizing that holiness is the exclusive means for receiving what heaven holds. And because the appeal of sin is instant gratification, few things require trust in God like living righteously. It's the brutal practice and the painful process of saying no to what is in front of you so that way you will one day be able to say yes to what God has not yet even made available to you. But I've come to encourage someone this morning. When God sees someone with the strength, with the stubbornness, with the self-control to decline sin's best offers today, so that way they will be able to say yes to what he has for them tomorrow. This is someone God knows he can trust. Because this means you don't fold easy. You're not controlled by your appetite, Recky. You're a person of conviction. You don't allow temptation to cause your trust in God to waver or your vision for what yet has not been made material to disappear. When God sees you, seek him, trust him. By living righteously today, God knows he can trust you because this means you clearly understand what your job is and you understand what his job is. This is what I've been waiting and wanting to tell you. I believe this right here has the power to repossess your joy. I think if you could just get this order right, it could change everything for you. Today is your job. Tomorrow is God's job. Obedience is your job. The outcome is God's job. Faithfulness is your job. The future is God's job. Seeking is your job. Supplying is God's job. The correct response is your responsibility. The correct result is God's responsibility. Your job is to let God do His job by having faith for the future and letting your trust in your Savior sustain you through today. Take a seat for a moment. I got six minutes and I feel like using them. Joy doesn't have to be something that you look forward to but never live in. Peace does not have to be something that seems possible for everyone else but you. A life free from anxiety, worry, and stress about your tomorrow does not have to be just wishful thinking. It can be your reality. Joy becomes your reality when you release yourself from the responsibility that was never meant for you to begin with. And let your greatest joy be found in this. Jesus already got the most important job done for you. The greatest worry you could ever have about your tomorrow, Jesus already took care of 2,000 years ago. Jesus lived a perfect and sinless life. Never once did he trip up. Never once did he screw up. Never once did he mess up. But yet, he was betrayed, he was wrongly convicted, he was falsely accused, and he died a criminal's death on a cross. And on that cross, as he hung there in your place, his final words were, It is 
finish, but take note, don't miss this. His final words were not, I am finished. This is because he knew that three days later, he would rise from the grave with all authority and all power in heaven and on earth. So that way, if you choose to place your hope and your trust in him, you would be free from the eternal punishment your sin has earned you. Accepting Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, placing your hope and your trust in him, is the biggest, best, and greatest decision you could ever make. But how crazy and how stupid of us would it be to believe that Jesus has the power to eternally save us, but not the power to temporarily satisfy us. Let the fact that Jesus loves you enough and is powerful enough to eternally save you from the punishment your sin has earned you, rescue the joy your worry from tomor for tomorrow is trying to steal from you by placing all of your problems in the proper perspective. If Jesus has the power to save you, then he has the power to satisfy you. If Jesus has the power to defeat death, then Jesus has the power to take care of your tomorrow. If Jesus has the power to conquer the grave, then Jesus has the power to have a plan for every mystery that makes you worry. Jesus did not endure 39 lashes. Jesus did not allow nails to be hammered into his hands and his feet. Jesus did not hang on a cross and die in your place just to save you and leave you here. Just to save you, for you to stay where you are just to save you, to abandon you now. No, Jesus has saved you and he sustained you because he's got a purpose and a reason for your life. Jesus does not view your salvation as the finish line of all that he hopes to do for you. Jesus views your salvation as the starting point of all that he desires to do in and through and for your life. The devil would never admit it, but the reason he's been trying to deceive you into believing that the future doesn't look bright is because he's terrified that if you realize that because the tomb is empty, your future is full of possibilities, it would cause you to live and believe and walk in faith in such a way that no tactic, that no scheme, that no weapon in his arsenal will be powerful enough to stop you from becoming who God's created you and called you to be. Oh, I wish you realized that because the tomb is empty, you can be full of hope. Because the tomb is empty, you can be full of faith. Because the tomb is empty, you don't have to fear the future. You don't have to be scared about what you can't see. You do not have to worry about tomorrow or anybody with faith in this place. Give Jesus some praise for a moment. Woo! You don't have to worry about tomorrow. If this word was for you, if you're able, I'd like you to stand to your feet. If you would, I want you to put your hands out in front of you like this, if this was for you. I want you to get into a posture, ready to receive. You can close your eyes, you can bow your head. In this moment, I wanna pray for you that as you trust God, that as you commit to seeking Him by living righteously, that you would get heaven's perspective of your situation in this moment. Problems bigger than yourself need a solution bigger than your problem. There are some problems that only God can fix. You know what's crazy? Jesus preached this sermon more than 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, Jesus knew about the worry in your tomorrow. So Father, right now, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice. God, I pray, Lord, that whatever source of anxiety, whatever source of worry, whatever source of stress in their tomorrow that's eating their lunch, that God, I pray, Lord, they'd receive heaven's perspective right now. And that God, you give them peace that surpasses all understanding. That God, you give them the strength to say no to today's temptation so that they can live in what you have for them tomorrow. God, I pray, Lord, for people to have the faith to persevere, to not quit, but to stay on the narrow path, the narrow path 
that leads to life. God, I pray, Lord, for every single person in this place, that God, as they obey you, that as they live righteously, that God, as they commit themselves to obeying your word, that God, you would honor their obedience. God, I love that song we sang earlier. We want you. I love the heart of that song, but God, sometimes we have needs. God, sometimes we have worries. And God, I thank you, Lord, that you are Jehovah Jireh, the provider. That, God, you're the Lord who's with us, but you go before us. So God, I pray, Lord, that you'd bring tomorrow's perspective into today. So that way we can begin to trust you with even more confidence and even more faith. But in the meantime, we're gonna be believing. We're gonna be living in faith. And we're gonna be walking righteously. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray together loudly. Amen.